Welcome to Everything Life Coaching. I'm John Kim. And I'm Noelle Cordo. We are the founders of Lumia. And we're super passionate about all things coaching, and we want to share what we've learned from over a decade of coaching and training thousands of life coaches. Let's dive into the science and magic of coaching. Hello, and welcome to Everything Life Coaching. I am Noelle, head of Lumia Coaching, and with me today, I have a special guest, one of my dear friends, colleagues. Uh, one of the head honchos, the COO at Lumia Coaching, and one of our dear instructors, Chris Clark. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Noelle. Can you give us a little bit of an orientation to the work that that you do and really specifically um, your experience in building a business as a coach to orient our listeners to where we're each coming from with our topic today. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I came into coaching out of a 20 year career in nonprofit leadership and higher education and uh, found my way into this space, having received a good amount of coaching in my career and eventually thinking that I wanted to develop the skill set so that I can in turn share it with my uh, direct reports, my mentees, and eventually build a, what I thought would be a side hustle as a coach and has turned into uh, the the full focus of my career at this point, both coaching individuals and leaders, as well as teaching the skills of coaching in Lumia's program and mentoring aspiring emerging coaches as they develop their businesses. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And clearing folks into to my path, my path is, is unique, I think, among coaches. Coaching as a discipline isn't that old. It's, it's under 40. And I've been in this space for 16 years. So I'm 43 years old right now. I got into coaching in my 20s, which is also unique for a lot of folks who are coaches out there. And I went right into coach training. I went right into my ICF credential. And I, I had my ICF credential before I was 30. And so I grew up as a coach in the space of coaching. And almost my entire career focus has been coaching, working in different sectors, uh, coach training and the development of the field. So that's where we're each coming from with our orientation. And today, what we're going to talk about um, is a topic that I'm, I'm delighted to talk about, which is some recent visibility that's come to our space through the New York Times and through ProPublica. There were two articles that came out recently. The New York Times article addresses coach training programs and the efficacy of coach training programs and some not so great stories about what have happened to individuals who have um, chosen a path that maybe wasn't the right path for them and and didn't really work out. And we'll talk a little bit about that more as we go on. And then the second piece that was published by ProPublica is a great piece. And it focused on um, some of the things that have happened to folks when they've worked with life coaches who weren't towing the line of ethics, whether that was a therapist who may have lost their licensure and then turned to coaching to continue to practice, or um, some folks who were just genuinely bad actors engaging in behaviors that were you know, outright wrong and harmful. Now, the reason why we are both here today is because within Lumia, uh, our students, our alumni, and even our team said, whoa, look at these articles that just came out. What does this mean? For us, what does this mean for us as coaches? And I left a voice note for our community sharing my thoughts. And we wanted to bring it to the podcast to provide a really balanced perspective on this issue. Um, Where I thought we could kick off is kind of zooming out and looking at the purpose of reporting in general, which is a good thing. It's to share information, to surface issues, and to talk about things that are, are happening in our time. 
Um, Chris, what's your perspective on the role of reporting in this type of, of scrutiny in general? Well, I think it's valuable. One of the challenges put forward in the New York Times article was to explore and expose the opaque, as they call it, the opaque underbelly of life coaching. And I think we do need to talk about this as an unregulated industry. There are, as you say, some bad actors in every space. So a conversation, transparent, open conversation where we can address these concerns and develop our discernment is only to the good and the benefit of our industry. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, thinking about those bad actors, you know, specifically in the ProPublic article, what we were, were seeing was um, theft, coercion, cult-like leader behaviors, and this kind of behavior is un, like abhorrent, obviously, but unfortunately, it's really common to humanity. And these types of things, uh, theft, coercion, cult-like leader behaviors uh, are not unique to people who build themselves as life coaches. In fact, in the last year, there have been really high profile exposés that have come out about the very same types of behaviors from church leaders, lawyers, um, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, tech industry leaders, and financial managers. And so these are things that happen across, you know, all different sectors. And um, Chris, you had some thoughts on like what the characteristics of an actual cult are. Yeah, I think that it's important to really think about what, uh, how is someone or an organization representing themselves? And the reason I want to talk a little bit about uh, cult indicators is because the, part of what these articles are describing share some of those kinds of features. And we need to take a look at this. So when we think about what are the characteristics and features of a cult, uh, according to Bethune-Cookman University and Very Well Mind, uh, what we know is it's, a, it's about isolating members and penalizing them for leaving. No tolerance for questions or critical inquiry. Absolute authoritarianism without meaningful accountability. Seeking inappropriate loyalty to the leaders or to the organization itself. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, these are the types of things that when people are susceptible, they fall prey to. And, and yes, this, this has happened vis-a-vis -vis folks who describe themselves as, as life coaches. And it's also happened so many other places um, throughout time. Another aspect of the ProPublica article was a really uh, specific focus on people who are therapists who lost their licensure for whatever reason, and they are turning to coaching as a way to continue practicing. Now, this is something that does happen. This is a real thing. This is something that deserves a spotlight and a flashlight and that should be talked about and looked at, whether it is a therapist or any other uh, type of profession that has licensure or credential associated with it. This would be very disturbing to see happen, whether this person was utilizing coaching to prop up um, a, a fail to go at therapy medicine or law are some other disciplines that really come to mind. And at Lumia, we've seen this happen. Uh, there have been one or two times where we've had someone knock on our door and say, hey, I lost my licensure. I want to become a coach. Um, and we have very kindly and politely said, I don't know that this is the right coach training program for you that doesn't align with the ICF code of ethics in terms of what our standards of practice are. So a lot of times when this scrutiny comes up, it does come from um, valid places that deserve a good hard look. What has your observation been? Well, 
Absolutely. And this is why in our coach training program, we spend so much time looking at scope of practice, very clearly defining what are the lines between what coaching is and what it's not and how it's different from a variety of other what we might call helping modalities. So often people are attracted to the life coaching profession and to this field because they are helpers. And there are a number of ways that uh, as humans, we can support, uplift, and help one another. And it's critically important when we're working with the mind (laughs) that we understand what the boundaries are in terms of our training, our licensure, and what we are qualified to offer. So that's when I'm teaching what is coaching. (laughs) and the ethics of coaching with our students. It's really about taking a look at how do I know the difference between when someone's at baseline health and wellness and coachable? And if that's not the case, how do I hold my ethical practice around what I can and cannot do in this space? Really important. It is. And and that's, you know, I never thought that I would become an ethics junkie. And yet I have and I am. And that's one of the reasons why I love the ICF Code of Ethics, because it's such a thorough and protective document with very um, rigorously outlined interpretive statements so that there's no question as to what coaching is, how you practice and what the standards of the industry are globally. Something that was really interesting that came out of the ProPublica article was focused on the state of Utah and the interplay between people who had been uh, harmed by folks who were practicing illegitimately and their legislatures. And from a legal perspective, if we're looking specifically at the juxtaposition of therapy and coaching and someone is is saying, I have been harmed, the first uh, rational line of questioning is, did the person who was coaching you diagnose you with a medical disorder? Did this person give you a treatment plan? Did this person enact medical treatment? Uh, and if the answer to those questions are, are no, then whatever has transpired is outside of the jurisdiction of legal remedy. Now, thinking about this from a kind of a, a broader sense, these are questions that we get often in our classrooms. And students say, how will I know if I'm doing therapy in a coaching session? And and my response is, have you ever been trained to diagnose a medical issue or disorder? Have you ever been trained to develop a treatment plan? Have you ever been trained to administer medical treatment? If the answer to all of those things are no, then you are likely not conducting therapy in your sessions because you don't know how to, right? And so there's, there's two sides to this equation of, of what's taking place from the practitioner perspective and how have the practitioners been trained. The ICF Code of Ethics and all of the standards that go into coach training have been very carefully designed to teach people how to stay within the bumpers of the bowling lanes of communication in facilitating a coaching conversation. There are um, tried and true, empirically based tenets and standards that define coaching. And let's let's also acknowledge, as you said at the top, this is a young profession, less than 40 years. It is still a bit of the Wild West out here. <laughs> and we are defining what the work of coaching is in real time. And the ICF, for those of us who are practitioners under their banner, really calls up to us to uphold the integrity of this profession. And what that means is that we are called, as we're building our practices, to also model the way for the marketplace to demonstrate through our behavior, through our words, through our marketing, what ethical coaching is. Yes, yes. And that is especially true because it's an unregulated field. And 
Another great point to explore here is how do things become regulated? Why is coaching unregulated? And is it possible for coaching to become regulated? I've said for a very long time that coaching as a discipline and as a profession, and I can speak only from a U.S. context because regulation is starting to take place in Europe. Regulation is starting to take place in India. Um, and and I've, I've heard murmurings otherwise globally, but in the U.S., Regulation is not going to take place without legislative will. That means that enough people need to ring alarm bells as such that their local, uh, state, or national legislators will take the time to put forth bills that need to go through our legislative process and then be codified into law that sets forth you know, very specific standards. So given that we're a young field, given that right now in 2024, I don't see a lot of legislative will coming up. You know, how about those life coaches out there doing damage? I don't see this happening for a very long period of time. So I think that we're going to be in this space of unsurety. My prediction is for at least another decade. That's my sense. Chris, what do you see? That that seems reasonable. Uh, it's uh, these wheels take time, right? And so, in the meanwhile, the question really is: How do I not navigate this space as a professional? And who do I want to be? And how do I want to show up? And I want to share um, what I'm an ethics junkie too. And uh, w- one of my favorite resources is a book called The Ethics of Caring by Kylia Taylor. And here's, w- here's what she has to say about it. Ethical behavior stems from the internal congruency and harmony between our values and our actions, between the value we have of wanting to do our best for our clients and our actual willingness to bring our best awareness and skills to that task. So the onus is on me, my friends, in terms of understanding what my values are and the onus is on me to screen for values alignment if I, when I'm looking to hire a coach or when I am looking to enroll in a coach training program. Yes. Yes. And I have to, to say that, um, in, in any emerging discipline, whether it's the science of coaching or looking at what's happening with AI right now, scrutiny is a really good thing. Standards and regulations are a really good thing. And ethics and standards exist outside of legislative will to your point. And the discipline of coaching, when it is properly taught and enacted within those professional standards, and regulations and code of ethics, for example, as put forth by the ICF, the International Coaching Federation, it holds up under scrutiny and can truly stand alone as a valuable discipline with really strong empirical underpinnings and strong data that backs the outcomes associated with the work of coaching. Um, A term that we both thought of as we were rolling into to our conversation was the term snake oil salesman. Why did that come up for you? Oh, because this is a feature of the human experience and it's so tender. We are susceptible when we are struggling, when we are um, hurting, when we are longing for something to be different, for a quick solution or a magical answer you know um i am when there have been moments when uh, i was struggling in my career and i would scroll instagram and look at you know hashtag um you know life coach your best life beach time you know and yeah i love to fantasize about the idea that there is a there is a a beautiful and easy way to do really heart-centered work 
uh, that's fulfilling and launched my own practice and hit six figures in the first six months. Where do I sign up? Ah, you know, and, and it, what you were interacting with uh, that really fueled your fantasy was often marketing. And yes. that's a big part of what people experience when they're searching for anything that is going to aid their hopes and dreams. Can you say a little bit more about how this all works and what coaches experience? Absolutely. So one of the things that we're experiencing in that moment is a marketing strategy that is focused on our pain points. That's what it's called focused on my pain points. So my discontent, um, my, my fantasies, my um, what's not working. And now there is nothing inherently wrong with this. We can talk about where are you now and where do you want to go and what's getting in the way. That's coaching, right? The, the thing that I would always encourage us to exercise some discernment around, though, is are they just talking to my pain points? And what is the um, solution they're selling me? If it sounds good, too good to be true, it probably is. Launching a business, a viable, sustainable, life-affirming coaching practice that generates enough revenue with which to live a, a reasonable quality of life is not a cakewalk. It is like launching any other business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's not something uh, to be scared of because with human service practitioners, again, whether we're talking about counselors, therapists, lawyers, doctors, coaches, physical therapists, massage therapists, um, energy healers like it's a very viable thing to wake up one day and think i'd really like to launch my own practice does it happen overnight no is is training in your craft alone sufficient to launch a practice no it absolutely isn't and that's one of the um pain points that i see coaches experience is Part one of learning a new craft, of learning a new discipline is to get legitimate training in your craft. If you wish to have your own practice versus work for someone else, the second part of what you have to do that's up to you to do is to learn how to launch a practice. Chris, how did you start that process? Because you worked for lots and lots and lots of organizations before you built what you thought was going to be a side hustle. What were <laughs> your actual steps? Right. Well, and, and here's the thing. And this is, I think, what's really important to disclose. I had a leg up. I had spent 20 years in business development communications, marketing, public relations, uh, a lot of the skill sets necessary uh, to launch my own coaching practice, messaging, uh, th thinking these things through, understanding how to communicate it, understanding how to develop a product that people might want. Uh, so I had that already in my operating system. And that was useful, not necessary, but it did give me a leg up. I still went on for uh, entrepreneurial training because I had never launched my own business. So I knew that in addition to the investment in the skill set, right, to learn how to coach, I was also going to need to make an investment in the infrastructure of my business. That included educating myself about what was new to me, as well as the systems and the tools and the ongoing professional training and development that I would need to have a successful platform from which to operate. Yeah. And, and for those of you listening, thinking, well, geez, I don't have 20 years experience in communications or business building. 
I'm actually a great example of, of the opposite. When I started, I was in my 20s. And genuinely, what I had was a diehard love of positive psychology and the absolute belief that I needed to get this science into the hands of as many people as possible because it changes lives, because it changes your brain. It changes the way that you can work with and understand your reality from a strengths-based, future-focused way, um, almost in a post-care, acute care function from therapy. So that was my why. That was my access point. And I struck out into the world in the suburbs of Philadelphia with a printed folder um, and some talking points about what coaching was, the types of people who engaged in coaching services. And I brought my little folder to every single spa, university, retreat center, probably in a four to six mile radius and just started talking to the hiring managers at spas and salons to see if anyone was interested in offering life coaching services at their establishment. And what ended up happening was I got a couple hits. I, I ran uh, sessions on the weekend at one place nearby. I gave talks at a, a local university for their professional development portion for their team. I gave uh, one of my earliest wins was I was invited to give a talk on positive psychology and body image for a women's um, cancer survivor group. And every time I put myself out there, one or two people would say, that's really cool. My mom, my sister, my brother, my cousin could really benefit from talking with you. And slowly over now approaching almost two decades, I built a word of mouth practice. I didn't market myself online. I don't have a marketing background. And my, my client base that I still have today is regional um, and network based. So that's just, there are so many ways to do it. And it's very possible for you, but it takes creativity, time, thought, persistence, intention. And it's not the case where if you build it, they will come. Um, a pitfall that I see for a lot of coaches is this idea that if I have a logo and a website, the faucets are going to turn on. Chris, how do you see this showing up? Right. I didn't have a logo or a website for the first three years of my practice. Okay. And what you're talking about here is so important. It is possible whether you have a business development background or not. If you have a why, that is the starting point. So this is the thing that I think is really important for us to be talking about in this industry. And it's, we are service providers. And so it is not sufficient to have a vision that I want to be location independent and have financial freedom. And that's why I want to be a coach. I can want those things. I, you know, that was part of um, my hope when I launched my practice. And those are, those are legitimate things to go for and to want. But that is not why people are going to hire me. People are not going to hire me because I want them to fund the desired lifestyle that I'm pursuing, right? People are going to hire me because I have a solution to what it is that they're grappling with. And this is why grounding in your why is so critical. So you talked about your passion for positive psychology and this, uh, this flame inside you, this spark to get that out in the world, to connect people with these tools that made such an impact in your life. You knew you had something that was worth sharing. So this is where I start with our students and graduates is what is that little ember that's burning inside you? That thing you have to say, that, that um, solution that you want to share, because that is what you're going to build from. Yeah. Yeah. 
And and speaking of of the building, you're you're so right in that when you take on the mantle of coach, you are a human service provider. And one of the things that I've really come to love about the discipline and that I wish I could have instilled in a deeper way in my younger self is that the empirical basis of the art and science of coaching is extraordinary and deep and enough. It is enough. Coaching as a discipline has been studied extensively over the past decades. And there are a lot of very well validated outcomes that have been associated with it and supported by advanced research. And these outcomes are improved performance, um, whether this is workplace, productivity, sports, academic achievement. Um, and this often comes from setting specific goals and the feedback loops that are implicit in coaching alongside developing strategies for improvement. That's how performance improves. Another one is increased goal attainment. Coaches help people develop actionable plans and a methodology to achieve them. Now, even just kind of separating this piece out, when someone has a goal, they don't instinctively sit down with a trusted other to actually lay out a plan and vet it. And that's one of the things that takes place in coaching. Another piece is enhanced self-regulation, discipline, and the belief that you can do things that are new for you. Um, the list is long. Greater well-being and life satisfaction, leadership development. Chris, this is your space. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, career advancement and transition. This is one that I want to talk about. Improved relationships and communication behavioral change and sustainability, and then really bridging out to a, um, a field of coaching that's really popping is organizational benefits. What happens to big systems, big organizations, communities, nations, when coaching is, is implemented? So Chris, what are some of your thoughts as I've been rattling away here with the outcomes? Well, you know, what I hear you saying in essence is there's a lot, there's a large body of research that tells us one thing. Coaching is legit. It delivers impact. Impact that in individual lives all the way through to multi-billion dollar corporations Oh, there's a return on investment when you are working with a well-trained professional coach. We know this to be true. We know this to be true. And we've talked about this elsewhere in terms of trends within the industry, the rise of uh, employment opportunities for coaches, how this is increasingly becoming institutionalized. And what this is, it's a method of relating a strategic thinking partnership. It is a toolkit, a skill set that's durable and transferable. So whether you're thinking about launching a one-on-one -on -one individual coaching practice and doing the, the entrepreneurial path, or something else, this skill set will serve you. And that's the part that I think is really important to talk about when we look at these kinds of um, exposés of the industry. Yes, yes. And so, you know, a lot of folks say, okay, well, what does it mean when you say the research? You know, what is this research? How does it work? And how does it directly translate into these outcomes? So, I am obsessed with relationships and communication. It is it is one of the things that gets me out of bed in the morning. I am a complete junkie for all science, relationships, and communication. And in our program within Lumia, one of the theories that we, we teach and is foundational in working towards these types of outcomes is Barbara Fredrickson's um, Broaden and Build Theory. The research itself came out of UNC Chapel Hill and the report was published by the National Institute of Health, the NIH. Now, what this study shows us 
is the neurobiological outcomes of inducing positive emotions. What does that mean in layman's terms for coaches? If our client has a goal, there are a series of outcomes that are associated with a very simple act of getting in touch with your strengths, your values, and taking the time to focus on positive emotions. One of those outcomes is increased verbal capacity that contributes to your ability to build and sustain durable social resources. That's the language from the literature. What does that mean in layman's terms? When you engage in positive thoughts and things that make you happy, you increase your capacity to communicate and other people like to be around you more and therefore you expand your capacity to have positive relationships in the world. So we follow this science through and get to coach training, arm coaches with this really cool data and information that they're then able to bring into session to support people who have these goals of increasing their own capacity to build and maintain positive relationships and communicate better. And that's, that's how that through line works when we're really talking about the research. As we're, as we're sitting with this and saying, okay, well, you know, this is what happens inside coach training programs. Let's talk a little bit about credentials and standards, ICF, what it means and what folks who are thinking about coach training or I've been uh, talking with folks who are interested in Lumia and something I'm hearing consistently is people are telling me it's really weird out there. There are a ton of programs. I, I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know how to choose. Can you just explain this world to me? So Chris, how do you explain it? Well, there's two dimensions here, right? So this is a professional development track. It's professional credential. If you're looking at ICF credentialing or an ICF accredited program, which we at Lumia are, this is professional training and development, right? So, so on the one hand, you're looking at what do I want to do with these skills? What, what skills am I looking to acquire? How do I think I might apply those skills? So these are the career types of questions. Or if it's for life enhancement purposes, what, what is it that I'm hoping to receive from this experience? So the first thing I'm looking at is um, the bona fides of the training organization. What's the curriculum? Uh, what's it rooted in? Uh, wh where, where are they coming from? What does it include? Um, and is the ICF accreditation important to me? So there's the, like, I'm looking, when I'm looking at any training program, you know, what are my objectives? What, what are the deliverables and outcomes from this program? How is it structured? Is it live instruction? Is it, is it online? Is it video modules? You know, we heard one of the things that we heard in this article was these really pretty, um, significant investments for a lot of training that was delivered by video modules, right? So thinking about what am I getting? Uh, what's, what's this level of investment? What do I hope for and what do I expect to receive in return for my investment, right? Um, because it's not just uh, taking a look at a dream. I'm, I'm also, let's look at this pragmatically. It's an education program. So there's, that's the first piece, Noel. And then the second piece is fit. This is the values part that I was mentioning earlier. Who are my people? There are a lot of really outstanding coach training programs in the market. For everyone like what was mentioned in these articles, there are many good ones. So the question is, who do I want to hang out with? Who do I want to learn from? What am I hoping to become? And what is the environment in which I am going to thrive? Going back to your, your passion piece, you know, what is your one special thing? What lights you up about this work? Um, when I started, I had the intuition and the insight that the ICF credential would be 
very valuable because there needed to be a way to differentiate what is a practitioner who has been legitimately trained and rigorously trained from a practitioner who has not been trained in a given space. So I did my generalist ICF training first. So that's what I did first. Um, and, and the ICF credential is generalist in that you can overlay a lot of different niche topics, a lot of different interests, and a lot of different other areas of expertise to really carve out your own niche in the world, or you're fully qualified to work as a coach within organizations running an agenda that is set forth for you. So you can do a lot of different things with a credential. From there, I took a lot of additional training specifically in applied positive psychology directly from experts in the space. I trained with Barbara Fredrickson. I trained under Caroline Miller. I trained with Kristen Neff. Um, and it was important to me to go right to the sources, to go right to the people who were publishing the reports in the NIH. Um, and, and a lot of this education is genuinely accessible to you if you take the time to, to look for it. The ICF is becoming writ large the industry standard for generalist coaching practices worldwide. In the space of health coaching, there are other really specific designations that will allow you to work within healthcare. So the field is kind of splitting into these two very specific bodies, which I think is a good thing because in order to work in the space of healthcare, you do need um, rather specific background to, to be able to, to deliver in those, in those venues. Chris, what do you look for? What have you looked for in determining what a reputable program is? The ICF accreditation helps separate the wheat from the chaff at this point. So that's one indicator. Uh, now, not everyone necessarily will be going for an ICF credential. And, and, that, and that's not necessarily, it doesn't need to be your goal. What it means to be ICF accredited is that an outside body has reviewed the curriculum and determined that it, it meets a, a particular set of sa standards as set forth by an outside third party independent association. So, so that vetting, I think testimonials. So here's the thing. Scandalous behavior makes for great stories. I, that's why we're here today. You know, read some scandalous stories. Uh, for every scandalous story, there are dozens upon dozens upon dozens of stories of inspiration and transformation as a result of going through coach training, regardless of whether or not someone ends up in going on to launch a one-on-one -on -one coaching practice. That's not everybody's aspiration, right? So look at the testimonials, talk to people who've done the programs, um, being able to speak to to someone about their program, you'll you'll learn a lot about the values and the vibe of a place by talking to the people who are a part of the school and the community, right? So taking a look at that sort of a thing, what do I want in terms of my experience? For me personally, um, I'm going to be honest, there, there are shenanigans and some bullshit in our industry. There is. Okay. And why I am affiliated with Lumia, why I've thrown in with this coach training program is because we tell the truth about it. If we're willing to talk about it, we don't sugarcoat, but we are filled with inspiration about what's possible and we help one another to achieve what it is that we're after, right? I was able in this community to find mentors and people ahead of me on the path to help show me the way. And that, in addition to my training, the training, as you said, was the foundation, but it was this community that helped me to launch a successful coaching practice. And plus, the other thing I was looking for, let's 
my friend, you're a smarty pants. Noel, if you haven't figured it out, everybody is a smarty pants. And she has a finger on the pulse of this industry. And I want to be in a space with an incredible translator. And that's what you are in effect, Noel. Brilliant. You scan the, the environment, you distill it, and you bring it back to us. And you tell us what it all means and where the opportunities lie. So this is a pretty distinctive and unique community. We also, another piece of it to me is that we are not interested in the status quo. We are interested in changing the face of this industry in many ways. And um, this deep commitment to what's possible for our industry, uh, I think that that is... um, incredibly important as well. So so those are some of the things that I'm looking for. Are these my people? Are we out to change the world for the good? Yeah. Yeah. And and, and would that we all have that orientation, you know, right? Um, And that's not everybody's orientation and that's okay. There are a lot of really great programs out there that are are built to gear people towards, you know, making that six figure plus out of the gate. And that's the focus. And that's okay. What we do at Lumia is we focus on, on the impact driven coach. Um, I run the open houses for, for Lumia. because I like to speak directly to people who are interested in the program. If I were at the starting line of discovering coach training, knowing what I know today, which is significant, one of the things that I would ask of a coach training program is what are the theoretical underpinnings of your curriculum? And a legitimate coach training program should be able to answer that question. I can answer that question. At Lumia, we draw from applied positive psychology, adaptive therapeutic technique, sports psychology, goal setting theory, coaching psychology, neurobiology, ethics, intersectionality, unconscious bias. These are all of the bodies of of research and literature that have gone into our coach training program. And I would hope that folks would be able to share that with you so that you could have a sense of what you're going to be learning and and where the discipline um, lives within a given, given context. Things that I've seen in this space that make me sad are high pressure sales tactics, um, very unclear or expensive pricing structures that are um, out of alignment with what market rate is for a professional certification. And I'm not just talking about coaching. I'm talking about a professional certification. If you want to gain any kind of professional certification, it's usually in the seven to $15,000 range, I'd say. That's about, you know, where professional certifications lie right now. Um, I've seen promises of unrealistic results out there. And so that's for, for you to discern. Um, and, and as Chris, as you talked about those pain points, you know, is the, the program that you're talking to really relying on um, those pain points. Now, I, I'd like to end on an optimistic note because a lot of people get into a career change or profession change, yes, because they want to drive their passions um, and change their lives and have that location-free <laughs> lifestyle where you can work virtually from anywhere. Um, and and it, it, is, it is possible. There, there are a lot of opportunities within our industry right now, and it's growing more and more. I have my own thoughts, but Chris, what are you seeing in the space? What are you seeing people doing with their coach training? Oh, so many expansive and gorgeous things. And I do want to affirm what's possible. I mean, it was possible. I'm living it. I, I'm living what I dreamed of six years ago. 
and I am seeing other people doing it too. I have seen people come out of our program with a very clear why, right? This is the, this is what I want, the impact I want to make. This is how I want to show up. This is how I want to use these tools. We, we have seen people go on to get, to deliver TED Talks, to publish books, to uh, be engaged, uh, to do big work with teams in corporate environments. We have seen people go and become uh, retreat facilitators uh, internationally. There are so many ways to apply this. And, and you and I both went into our local communities and pitched uh, workshops, classes, trainings. Uh, my world has expanded as a result of getting out there and sharing the work of coaching with others. And that is what I'm seeing with uh, so many people in this space. We're dreaming and we're doing, and that has ripples. It does. It has so many ripples. It's, uh, I, I sat for a mentor session with one of our students and actually watched the coaching session, and I just wept openly because of the change that was being created in one individual's life. And that's just one moment of, of transformation. Um, very this is the thing I want to, if I may, oh, this is what I want to bring us back to it as we as we bring to a close this topic. You know, we started with this, the opaque underbelly of the industry and snake oil sales. And I want to conclude with the transformative impact that coaching has on individual lives. And more than anything else in my experience building a coaching a successful coaching practice that it has exceeded all my hopes and expectations the thing i bring home to the bank in the end is the impact that my work is having on individual lives and that um there's no price that i can put on that and that's that's what it's also really all about that's the why. That's why we do what we do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, everyone, for hanging with us today. And if you if you have questions, if you'd like to learn more, um, come see us at, at Lemia Coaching. I, uh, our team, are always happy to connect and talk to you directly. Thanks so much and have an awesome day. Thanks for listening to Everything Life Coaching. If you're feeling the draw to become a coach, head to lumiacoaching.com slash everything. Explore a new career that brings fulfillment, gives you a true sense of purpose, and a bold community to do it with. Lumia is ready to equip you with the tools, training, and community you will need to reach your goals. If you're ready to build a unique coaching business on your own terms while making an impact on the world at large, Lumia is the next bold step in your coaching journey. That's lumiacoaching.com slash everything. And hey, if you're waiting for a sign, this is it.